It was a young guy who was uh, put in prison. It was his first day in prison, and he's sitting in the cafeteria across the table from a guy that had been there for decades. That guy had been there, you know, a long time. And they're just sitting there kind of chit-chatting, and all of a sudden, uh, one of the inmates across the cafeteria stood up and said, 84, and the whole place just burst out laughing. Everybody just started roaring laughing. A couple of minutes passed, and another guy on the other side of the cafeteria jumped up and said, 17, and man, the whole place just erupted in laughter, and the young guy looked at the the older inmate and said, "Um, what's the deal with the numbers? He goes, well, we love jokes here, but all of us have been here so long. We've all heard each other's jokes so often. We just numbered them, and now we don't tell the joke. We just say the number, and everybody has a good laugh. <laughs> and the young man said, wow, that's something. He said, do you mind if I try it? And the guy said, sure, go ahead. The young man jumped up. He said, 24. Nothing. Nada. I mean, you hear crickets chirping. And the young man looked at the older inmate and said, why aren't they laughing at my joke? He said, you didn't tell it right. So um, <laughs> what I want to do today, you like that one? <laughs> what I want to do today is kick off a, a, a series for July that I'm calling Laughter Doeth Good. Amen. Do you know the Bible actually says that, that? That the Bible says laughter does good like a medicine, that there's a medicinal quality to laughing and to joy. And over the next few weeks, we're going to discover or rediscover Uh, the role that joy and laughter has within our life. And I'm really looking forward to that. And uh, we've got some things to discover together uh, over the next few weeks. But I want to kick this series off today on the eve of the eve of uh, the 4th of July by uh, speaking to some things, I think, culturally, nationally, that uh, we should address. My remarks will not just be as a collective, but also to us individually. But I do feel like uh, we'd be remiss not to address things that are important to address at a time like this nationally. Y'all okay with that? Y'all good with that? Yeah, uh, three of you are very confident (laughs) that it's going to be okay. Uh, How how many love to laugh? Say, I do. I I love to laugh. I love to be around people that make me laugh. It's why David Bodwan is one of my favorite people on the planet. That dude can make me laugh. Uh, I love to laugh. Um, I find that uh, laughter uh, really endears you to people. One of the reasons I typically open up my message with a Boudreaux and Thibodeau joke is it kind of endears me, uh, I hope, at least to people, and they'll give me a few minutes to speak to them if I can kind of just break the ice that way. And I think all of us use humor along those lines. It does. It it, it is a, a powerful thing. But what I want to address today has nothing to do so much with our laughter as it does God's. I want to take the next few minutes and I want to talk to you about when God laughs. When God laughs. Psalm chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, read like this. Why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. We're in a moment in American history where much of our culture looks at the things that God requires of us as fetters as a form of imprisonment, as chains, as if God wants to hold you down. Nothing could be further from the truth. God's laws are liberating. And any of us that know him, really know him, we've discovered that very personally. But collectively, as a culture, much of America sees the laws of God, the the requirements of God as something restrictive, as something uh, burdensome. And and what we see is, once again, here in America, there seems to be a collective shaking of the fist in the face of God on the part of our nation. And and it seems like our country is trying to tell God what they're going to do. We want to tell God the way it's going to be. We're going we're gonna to try to tell God, uh, we're not going to listen to you. We're not going to give any kind of credence to the things your word declares that we should be or we should do. No, 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 no. We've got this all figured out. We're going to do our own thing. 
And the Bible says as we take that posture, and you see it. Don't you see it across the country? You see it happening. And as we do that, the Bible said, God laughs. He laughs in a way that is a scoffing way, as if to say, you think so? You see, when God laughs, it's sometimes at us, not with us. Now, I I don't want you to get me wrong. I, I believe that God wants to laugh with us. I believe God would like nothing better than for us to do his will and bring great joy to his heart. And I believe that our capacity to laugh and to find joy in moments of purity is a reflection of the one who created us. I believe God laughs. I I do believe there are times when he is so pleased with us, where he is so, uh, so filled with strong feeling towards us that it, that it, burst out in a God giggle. I I do believe that. I believe that with all my heart. I believe that what you see in humanity is a reflection. I mean, we were created in his image. And just like we have the capacity to laugh in a way that's pure and good, I believe God does as well. But but when we see Psalm chapter 2 and passages like it in the Bible, we see there's another side to the laugh of God that scoffs at what we say we're going to do. And and, and it's, it's... Reminiscent for me of those times, and I'm sure you've seen this before. Uh, I I love to run, and I've done a good bit of running early in the morning. I run through neighborhoods, and and have you seen? Have you have you had those moments where where there's this huge dog? Maybe he's a German Shepherd or a Rottweiler, and I mean just massive. And then right beside him is this little lap dog, this little Chihuahua that's telling that big dog, you know what for, right? And it just just going after this big dog. And we know the Rottweiler could just reach over and bite his head off, probably swallow him whole. But he doesn't even bother with him. He he hardly even acknowledges him. Why? Because he knows. Somebody say he knows. knows. And and as I read Psalm chapter 2 and as, as I hear God describes his response to a collective that shakes their fist in his face, I'm reminded of that little chihuahua. I'm reminded of that great big God. And I, I, I realize he knows. Come on, y'all. He knows. We had a, a prophet stop by our church here a while back. It's been several years ago. Uh, and, and, hey, I don't want to make light of the office of prophecy. I believe in it strongly. I believe that God anoints people to speak prophetically uh, over people's lives. I, I strongly believe in that role. But then, but then there are those self-proclaimed prophets, Right? that just, you know, want to just say whatever's on their mind and, and attach God to it. Y- y'all know who I'm talking about? I mean, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm talking about? It, you have those folks, and typically those folks go Old Testament on you. They, they don't acknowledge that we're in an hour of grace, and they want to be able to predict and prophesy the kind of things the Old Testament prophets uh, predicted and prophesied. Uh, and, and typically that's how you know who's, who's real and who's not real. And, um, and so this guy, this prophet stops by and he, has a, he, he lets me know, he introduces himself and he lets me know he's got a word for our church. He said, I have a word for the church. God's given me a word for your church. Now, I don't know this guy. I never met him, never laid eyes on him. But he says, God's given me this word for the church. And he's got, he wants to know, he wants to get out the calendar. When am I going to give him a Sunday morning to share his word with our church? And I just looked at him and I said, hey, buddy, that's not going to happen. Because what I know is I know that God instruct me as a pastor to know those that labor among us. I'm not to let anybody uh, and everybody just stand up here and speak into the life of our church when I don't know them. I've not vetted them in any way, right? And so I don't know this guy. So I just looked at him and I said, hey, man, that's not going to happen. He said, you're not going to let me share the word of the Lord? I said, no, sir, I am not. And he said, this is what he said. He said, okay, then uh, you need to, uh, he said, you need to make preparations. You've got three months. And, and y'all, when he said it, I'm just telling you, there was a part of me that rose up that wanted to just jack him, you know? (laughs) Hey, look, I'm saved, but I'm not completely sanctified yet. But there's that part. And then there was this other part that it was all I could do, Brody, not to just laugh in his face. Because I know. I know. I know what God has instructed me. I know what the Word of God said. I have the authority of Scripture. I He's, he's operating outside of the authority of Scripture, and I know it. And so I look at him, and I go, are you telling me I got three months to live? And he looked at me, he said, 
get your affairs in order. You got three months. And I said, well, sir, let me just let you know, you got three minutes. <laughs> I had a big old smile on my face. I said, you got three minutes to get out of here or you're going to wish you did. So listen, that was probably 13 years ago. I knew. There's a confidence in what you know. And I think if God snickers at the insolence of the posture of our culture, it's because he knows Come on, y'all. He knows. He knows that in the last day, saith God, I'll pour my spirit out over all flesh, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will have visions. He knows there's a move of God coming. Perhaps you might have seen our friend out in front of the church the last couple of Sundays with his signs. When I got home from vacation and they told me what happened, I, again, I just kind of chuckle because I know. I know the way the Lord works. I know that man's just full of the devil. And, and, and I know that we have authority over Satan. And I know that God is going to move in that man's life. I can't wait for him to be on the worship team. I can't wait to baptize him. I can't wait to see him up on the screen sharing his testimony. Come on, y'all. I know. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 22 through verse 27. By the way, if you want to know how we responded to him, uh, our guys brought some cold water out to him. Talk to him about the Lord. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 22 through verse 27 says, How long will you simple ones love your simple ways? Come on, y'all. This is God talking to us. How long will mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? If you had responded to my rebuke, I would have poured out my heart to you and made my thoughts known to you. But since you rejected me when I called and no one gave heed, when I stretched out my hand, since you ignored all my advice and would not accept my rebuke, I in turn will laugh at your disaster. I will mock when calamity overtakes you. When calamity overtakes you like a storm, when disaster sweeps over you like a whirlwind, when distress and trouble overwhelm you, that's when God laughs. See, God laughs when we tell him what we're going to do. God laughs when we tell him what we're going to do. Go to James. Let's look at the New Testament. James chapter 4, verse 13 through verse 17. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we'll go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, make money. What? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will. We will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast and brag. All boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it sins. So God's saying, this is what's going to make him laugh in a way, again, that's not with us, but rather at us, is when we tell him what we're going to do, even though we know it doesn't align with his will. And so many of us are guilty of that. We had a, a comedian here at the church a couple years ago for a, an Inspire Night of Comedy, and great guy. He was from the South here, so we could all appreciate his humor. And, and he talked about growing up in the home of a mother that most of us can relate to. And his mother had this little catchphrase, and her catchphrase was, well, I'm going to tell you what you're not going to do. <laughs> Come on, how many of us raised by that kind of mama? I was, man. I was raised by that kind of, I'm going to tell you what you're not going to do. <laughs> You may do this, you may be do, do that, but you're not going to sass me. You're not going to talk. I'll tell you what you're not going to do. And I think that's what we hear in the laughter of God today. God's saying, I'll tell you what you're not going to do. See, God laughs when we tell him what we're going to do. And God laughs when we tell him what we're not going to do. And I think there are more of us guilty there than the other. I think most of us are guilty at some point or other and say, no, God, I'm, I'm not doing that. We know that God's leading us in one area or another, and we just set our heels, and we just determine not going to do it. Just not going to do it. In fact, can I just share with you that as a boy, I had a relationship with the Lord. I was Saved and baptized with the Holy Spirit when I was eight years old. Had a wonderful encounter with God, a relationship with the Lord. I knew there was a call of God upon my life. But through adolescence, growing into my teen years, I decided 
that I didn't want to follow the call of God on my life that had been on my father's life. And, and I began to say, I will never be a preacher. I began to say, when people would ask, hey, you going to be like a pastor like your dad? I would let them know, no way. And most of them, you know, didn't take me serious. And so I began to cuss when I said it to prove to them that I wasn't going to be a pastor. And I began to embrace in my teen years things that led me further and further and further away from God and away from the call of God just to prove to him I am not going to be the pastor you've called me to be. And yet here I am. (laughs) Don't think you're going to tell God what you're not going to do. Have you read the book of Jonah lately? I recently reread it in my read through the Bible uh, time in the mornings. It just reminded me, never tell God you're not going to do something. You know the story of, of Jonah. He's called to go share uh, God's truth in Nineveh, and he don't want anything to do with it. In fact, he gets in a boat to head the opposite direction from Nineveh. And before you're too quick to criticize Jonah, I wonder what boat you're in right now. <laughs> Headed away from what you know God has told you to do. And I just came to church this morning to to just warn you, don't make God send a big fish. (laughs) Come on, if you know the story, you know what happens. He gets out on that boat. A storm comes that terrifies everybody on board. They know this is the judgment of God. They cast lots to find out who's guilty. It falls on Jonah. Jonah said, yeah, it's me. They say, what do we do? And he goes, throw me overboard. He's so desperate not to do the will of God, he'd rather die. And so they throw him overboard. God sends a big fish, swallows him whole. He lives three days, three nights in the belly of that fish until the fish spits him out on the shore of Nineveh. God's going to get you where he wants you to go. He's going to get you where you want to go one way or another. I just hope it ain't a fish ride for some of us. Hmm. God laughs at our insolence. And our irreverence. And, and if, I could just, if I could just camp out there for just a second. Because if I think there's one thing that really marks our culture today, it's this idea of irreverence. We have become a people of unclean lips. Uh, with such ghastly irreverence toward God and all of God cre- God's creation towards one another. There's such great insolence and such great irreverence that has settled down into the very fabric of our culture today. And I want to read to you Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Here's what the Bible says. It says, make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Now, many times we read the word of God very superficially We never look below the surface to see what the scripture is saying. And so we know God is calling on us to be holy as he is holy, but we never link that to our effort to live at peace with all men. We never link those two things together. And you need to link them today and understand and realize, typically when we think about holiness, we think about about things we don't do. We we don't drink and we don't, you know, uh, have sex outside of marriage and and, and, you know, all those things that we, we want to say, okay, that's holiness. The holiness is the things you don't do. Yes, yes, there are some things you don't do as, as your holiness towards God you don't participate in. But holiness is as much about what you do as, as it is about what you don't do, including having peace with your fellow man. And one of the most blatant forms of unholiness and irreverence within our culture today is the way we treat one another. Is the way we go off on one another all week long and then come and act like we're going to worship God. And the Bible said, how can you say you love a God you've never seen when you hate the brother standing right there in front of you? And you treat them with insolence and you treat them with disrespect. And God wants us to know today to be holy. We've got to treat each other well. God laughs at what we say we're going to do, at what we say we're not going to do. And he laughs at this posture of insolence and this posture of irreverence because at the end of the day, come on, y'all, God knows. He knows that he's going to do whatever it takes to bring us to a place of humility. Some of us can remember what happened in 9-11. 
We can remember what happened on 9-11. We can remember how the whole country was in this posture with their fists shaking in the face of God, telling God what we're going to do, what we're not going to do. And all of a sudden, in an instant, our nation was on its knees begging God for mercy. There were thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of people post 9-11 in the weeks that followed that gave their hearts to Jesus, many that are still serving the Lord today. Many of you were in that group because God, at the end of, uh, at the, end of the day, He's going to do whatever he needs to do. He's going to allow whatever he needs to allow to bring us from that place of riotous living to a place of reverence before him. Are you hearing what I'm telling you today? God's going to do whatever it takes. There was a a French philosopher by the name of Voltaire. Many of you studied him in in your history classes in school. And Voltaire uh, said this, very arrogantly, he predicted that within 100 years of his death, the Bible wouldn't even exist. He said it won't even exist. It'll be so long forgotten that, that there won't even be a copy of the Bible in existence. Now, here's the irony. 100 years after Voltaire's death, the Bible was circulating the planet like never before, and it was being printed in Voltaire's house. They turned it into a printing press, printed the Bible, and shipped it all over the world. Come on. That's why God laughs. Even at our insolence, even at our irreverence, God can laugh. Now, let me say this because I think it's so important to qualify. God's laugh is not in a cruel way, but in a redemptive way. God laughs in a redemptive way. Come on, y'all. He's a redeemer. Isaiah 53 verse 10 is a passage that, again, if you read it superficially, if you just read it on the surface, um, it's hard to understand. Here's what the scripture says. Prophetically, Isaiah is speaking prophetically about the Messiah, Messiah who would come, who today we know was Christ, was Jesus, it was God's son sent into the world to do everything God promised he would do. But here's what Isaiah predicted. It says, the Lord was pleased to crush him, this Messiah. The Lord was pleased to crush him and make him ill. Although his soul is made a reparation offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the desire of the Lord will succeed by his hand. Are there things, is there anything in your life that just makes you giggle? I mean, I mean that you, you can't suppress the laugh. There's a couple of things for me that, that I just, I can't hold it back. I can try, and, and, and I can't hold it back. Uh, one, um, Early in the morning on a, a freshly groomed black ski slope. First thing in the morning, wide open, and I'm skiing. I don't know how fast I'm going, but it's way too fast. I can't suppress it. It just comes out. I just start giggling like a school boy. When I'm on a horse that I know I can trust, and I'm in an open, flat area that I know there's not any holes or anything, and I get him up at full gallop, and I got the reins up by his ears, and I'm leaning over his neck at full gallop. I'm telling you, I can't hold it back. I just start giggling like a little kid. God is describing what he's going to do to his anointed one. But the Bible said it pleases him to know what it's going to achieve. What's it going to achieve? Your redemption. That moment where he brings you from that riotous position you're in to that place of reverence before him. Do you remember the story of the prodigal son? You remember how he shook his fist in the face of the father and said, I want what's mine, and I'll tell you what I'm going to do. And the father gives him his inheritance, and he goes, spends it on what the Bible describes as riotous living. And he ends up in a pig pen eating what the pigs would eat and has an epiphany, aha moment, and goes, I had it better at the father's house, and rehearses a speech and gets to the father and says, I'm not even worthy to be your son. What are you seeing out of him now? Reverence, 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 reverence. And that's what God's getting ready to do in America. I don't know what it's going to take, but he's going to bring us from a place of this riotous posture we've taken to a place of reverence before him because our God is a redeemer. Now, real quickly, let me just give you a few things to consider about what reverence looks like. Number one, it looks like purity in our speech and our conduct. It looks like purity. Everybody everybody say purity. Purity. 
2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness. How do you do it? Perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. It's reverence that leads to a holy lifestyle, and that's where God wants to bring us. I I love movies. You guys know that. I love movies. Uh, A few... uh, a while back, I, got, I saw a preview for a movie that I thought, man, that looks good. I think I'd really enjoy seeing that. But it had an R rating. So I have a, a, a resource that I use where I can go on and I can find out exactly, you know, what the content of that movie is, why, why it's rated the way it is. And when I looked this movie up, y'all, it said there were 143 F words in the movie. Now, obviously, I didn't go see it. But I sat there after I read that and I thought, How many words is in the movie? You know what I'm saying? There's 143. I think most of the words in this movie begin with the letter F and are irreverent. And I need you to understand as a believer, you can't talk like that and please God. You can't conduct yourself the way this fallen world conducts itself and bring any smile to the face of our Father. Y'all with me? Number two, what does reverence look like? It looks like treating each other with respect. And if you're on social media, you know we aren't. Treating each other with respect. But, but that's what reverence looks like. It looks like treating each other with respect. Ephesians 5.21 says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. In other words, real reverence in your life will lead to us submitting to one another, loving one another, encouraging one another. Again, we can't claim to truly love God who we've never seen while all along disrespecting our brother standing right there in front of our face. We have become uh, politically polarized. Am I gonna have to come down there and amen myself? We've become politically polarized. And so we're at one another's throat constantly. We're bickering, we're fussing, we're fighting. And and we gotta cut it out. If we're gonna show reverence to God, we've gotta show reverence to one another. Number three, reverence looks like worshiping God faithfully. Worshiping God faithfully. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 says, since we're receiving a kingdom that can't be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably So here's how we're going to find out what acceptable worship looks like. Worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. Acceptable worship always contains reverence and an an awe towards God, a respect towards God. So reverence includes the house of God. You can't live reverently before the Lord and neglect God's house. You just can't do it. And yet many of us are trying to do that. we got a ton of people online with us right now, and I'm glad you're joining us online, but you belong here. You belong in the house of God. If if you're capable of being here, you should be here. You should be connected. You should be engaged. We should be serving one another, serving alongside one another. It's part of our reverence towards God. Part of it is our reverence towards the house of God. Get back to church, and let's humble ourselves before God and live a life that is holy before God in our reverence towards his house. Number four. Number four is leading others to Christ. Reverence looks like leading others to Christ. First Peter chapter three, in this passage, Peter's addressing specifically married couples, but it, it extends beyond matrimony. The concept or the principle extends beyond matrimony. He says this, first Peter three, verse one through two. Um, he says, wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husband so that if any of them don't know the Lord or, or don't believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of your life. So God's saying living in a way that we're reverent towards God and one another is an evangelism tool. It, it, it's one of the most convincing things that you can do to lead people to Jesus. So, we're talking about when God laughs. And let me just wrap up today by saying that when God laughs, it should be out of joy over the souls that we're leading to Christ. We see a couple of places in Scripture where God laughs. One is at the insolence and and the irreverence of people that he knows at the end of the day are going to answer to him, right? And then the other place that we see joy in the heart of the Father is when people are getting saved. Maybe that explains, for those of you that are new to this house, 
why every service we give people an opportunity to come to know Christ. Because it brings joy to the heart of our Father. It gives God a giggle. I think it takes heaven and lets heaven just slap its knee and have a good old time when people are giving their hearts to Christ. Consider this with me. If you've studied the messianic passages of the Bible, you know that Jesus was known as a man of sorrows. He was known as a man of sorrows. And I believe to a great extent today he still is a man of sorrow because so many people don't know him. They've not experienced him. They've not experienced his redemption. And it brings great sorrow to his heart because so much of his family are ignoring those who don't know him. It brings real sorrow to his heart. But the closest the New Testament comes to a snapshot of Jesus laughing out loud is Luke chapter 10, verse 21. The disciples have been sent out two by two to preach the kingdom, cast out demons, heal the sick. And they come back and they're given this report to Jesus of all that God's done through them. And in Luke 10, verse 21, the Bible said Jesus was full of joy through the Holy Spirit. They put a big old smile on his face. And I wanna do that today. Do you? I, 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 want, I want to make God laugh out loud. This is in Luke 15, verse 7. Luke 15, verse 7. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing, I think you could say laughter, in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who, who do not need to repent. God loves it when people get saved, when people commit their heart and their life to him. I'll give you one more passage and I'll wrap this up. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. You were probably just reading there this past week, right? Uh, Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. The Lord your God is with you. Somebody say, thank God. The Lord your God is with you. He's a hero who saves you. Be a good place for another amen. He happily rejoices over you, renews you with his love, and celebrates over you with shouts of joy. What makes God chuckle? What cracks God up? What makes God giggle? You do. You do. When you align yourself with his will, you do what he's called you to do. You become who he's called you to become. My question in close is, how will we make God laugh today? Well, I sure hope that the message really resonated with you today. Perhaps you're someone who's never really made a commitment to Jesus Christ. Today, I want to give you an opportunity to give your heart to God. If you're someone who can't really say you're living for God, if the truth is you're just living for you, if you're someone who has no real assurance about what awaits you when this life is over, listen, God loves you today. He's made provision for you to be saved and forgiven of all of your sins. You can be made right with God. He wants to give you a brand new life here and now and an eternal life when this life is over. And here's what he says in Romans chapter 10. He said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He is simply waiting on you to call on him and make him Lord of your life. Why don't we do that right now by praying a very simple prayer together. Just pray this prayer. Let these words come right from your heart. God's going to hear that prayer. He's going to forgive your sins. He's going to make you right with himself. Let's pray. Dear God, I come to you right now in the name of Jesus. I know that I'm a sinner. I know my sin separates me from God. I don't want that. I believe in Jesus. I believe he died for me. I believe he rose again through faith in Jesus. I believe my life can change. So I ask you, Jesus, come into my heart, forgive all my sin and change my life. Be Lord of my life. From this day forward, I don't live for me anymore or the world around me. God, I want to live for you. Help me to do that. And God, I thank you right now, even as I pray according to your promise 
My sin is forgiven. I'm now right with God. I am saved. Thank you, God, for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, if you just prayed that prayer with me, hey, we want to know about it. Would you just text the word SAVED, S-A-V-E-D, to the number that we've provided so that we can connect with you and give you some next steps. God bless you today, and thanks so much for joining us.